Good afternoon, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, welcome to today's seminar on policy priorities for international trade and jobs. Uh, my name is Carol Guthrie, and I'm the Assistant United States Trade Representative for Public and Media Affairs, and I am very pleased uh, to have the opportunity to moderate this event, which is being sponsored by uh, the OECD and the Jobs Knowledge Platform, which, as many of you know, is uh, managed by the World Bank and a number of institutional partners. Uh, we welcome not only those of you who are here in the room today, uh, but also uh, those who are watching the live stream of this event on the Jobs Knowledge Platform's Facebook page. And uh, for those of you on Facebook, we will try to include some of your comments and, and questions in the question and answer session at the end of this period. Uh, before we do that, though, um, let me introduce today's um, distinguished panelists. We have uh, to present the um, findings of the uh, of the eyesight uh, body of studies. We have uh, Ken Ash, who is the director of trade and agriculture at the OECD. We have uh, Dr. Bill Spriggs, who is uh, recently of the U.S. Department of Labor and now the chief economist at the AFL-CIO. We have uh, Daniel Laterman, who is the lead economist of the International Trade Department at the World Bank, and uh, Nancy Donaldson, who is the director of the Washington <coughs> Office of the International Labor Organization. Uh, before they speak and before um, and before we take uh, your questions and, and comments and, and those from the Facebook audience, I just would like to offer a few uh, thoughts to frame the conversation, hopefully just a little bit after we hear uh, the results of, of the eyesight studies. Um, we're coming here together at, at a very dynamic time in trade policy. Right now, about an hour and a half away, uh, two hours depending on the traffic. Uh, Negotiators from nine countries are hammering out a, a dynamic trade agreement uh, among Asian, a, Asia Pacific nations with the Trans Pacific Partnership. Um, in Geneva, uh, there are new discussions going on uh, past a page turning um, of there in Geneva on uh, new and productive opportunities from streamlining the accession of least developed countries into the World Trade Organization to the possibility of a new uh, plurilateral agreement among like-minded countries on services. Um, but it's not only the substance of trade policy that's changing right now. It's the conversation that we're all having on trade in the world, and it is the expectation of individuals about what trade policy needs to do for them. Um, in the wake of the global recession, really prior to the global recession, but certainly in the wake of the global recession, uh, people and the people we try to serve in our work are not satisfied uh, with platitudes about trade. Um, theory does not put a paycheck in the bank and it does not put food on the table and they want to see facts not only on paper but in their own lives that trade can support jobs, can support jobs where they are and can support jobs that bring them better lives. Um, that is a conversation that we have been having in the United States, in the Obama administration. Uh, we have learned and found some success in working to listen to a broader range of stakeholders and working to craft trade policy that is more responsible in our view and more responsive to the concerns of Americans on uh, issues from labor to the environment to um, the assurance that trade will in fact support jobs here at home. Uh, so. Right now what the public is demanding is that when policymakers look at trade, they look not only at how trade affects the wealth of nations, but how it affects the finances of families. I think uh, some of the information that uh, is found in this very rich eyesight study um, is going to be very informative in that regard. Um, it is talking to us about how trade contributes to job growth. It is confirming for us that trade policy cannot stand alone if it is to be effective. And it also confirms for us that even the best trade policy is going to create challenges in some communities and that uh, policymakers are going to need to take a, a comprehensive look to make certain that people are better able to ride the wave of change that is inevitable in some places due to globalization and trade. So with that, I will uh, stop and we will turn it over to Ken Ash, who will give us a presentation on the eyesight findings and then we'll continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. Uh, that was an impressive and a comprehensive introduction. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I guess it's afternoon now, uh, everybody. Um, I'm going to um, share with you um, some of the key results from 
uh, work that we launched uh, at the OECD with uh, nine other uh, international organizations. Uh, their logos uh, appear here. Um, this work um, followed on from some uh, earlier um, preliminary efforts that um, produced a report for the Korean uh, G20 uh, presidency back in 2010. Uh, but I think all of us wanted to go further and to look a little more deeply at this uh, complicated issue of the relationship between trade and growth uh, and jobs. Um, the book that uh, is the basis for much of my presentation, Policy Priorities for International Trade and Jobs, has been available for some time. And I think it does do a, a credible job of uh, trying to um, paint a, a more empirically founded picture uh, of the link between trade, growth, and employment. But I think it, it does another thing uh, to some degree, and we'll, we'll see at the end of this session just how much of a degree, and that is to try and move towards a, a more commonly held view uh, amongst um, advisors, uh, including the advisors and each of these 10 international organizations, as exactly what is the relationship between trade and jobs, what is the relationship between trade policy and a host of, uh, of potential companion policies. Now, having said that, the presentation that I am going to give you is my own. It draws on the material uh, in the book. Uh, so it'll uh, try to take from uh, the e economics uh, the key messages that, uh, that I believe are important for, for policymakers. So if you're here to, to learn about elasticities and econometric niceties, you'll be disappointed. If you're not, you won't be. Uh, let me begin uh, with the conclusion. Um, I think the book is very clear. Market openness can be uh, a factor promoting long-term growth, improving employment and wages, and contributing to better working conditions in all countries, developed, emerging, and less developed e economies. But, and this is a very important but, and it sometimes gets forgotten, these positive impacts are not at all automatic. Complementary policies are needed in a number of areas, public investment in human resources and physical infrastructure, macroeconomic policies, governance systems and institutions that create a positive climate for investment for businesses, and of course active labor market policies and social protection policies to assist individuals and the people that Carl talked about a moment ago. I'm going to look at each of those areas in a little bit more detail. Um, it's not a surprise for many of you, Try, uh, trade uh, drives growth through its contribution to increasing productivity. And everybody, I think, understands the role of exports in allowing for greater specialization, economies of scale, scope, and so on. But not everybody understands or remembers all the time the role of imports in ensuring that firms have access to intermediate goods and services that allow them to produce and produce competitively. Uh, recent work at the OECD on the role of regional and global value chains uh, highlights in particular the importance of imports. More than half of global trade in goods is in intermediate inputs and over 70 percent of trade in services globally is in intermediate inputs. So in other words, firms who wish to remain competitive need to have, and in large part do have, but not always, access to world-class inputs in order to improve their productivity, grow their uh, companies, and in due course export, or serve domestic markets. There is reference to uh, 14 multi-country econometric studies uh, in, the, in the report. All 14 concluded that openness to trade raises national incomes. Now, lots of you may not like econometric studies. All of the available country studies, the case studies that we have looked at, reach the same conclusion. And of all the studies available, not one has shown that trade restrictiveness has had a long-term positive impact on growth. Rather, the impact of trade restrictions is often to tax the poor disproportionately, to create perhaps a few jobs, but at very high cost, and overall to stifle productivity and growth. There's a great deal of literature that suggests open economies grow faster than closed ones, and I'm going to quickly just show you a couple of 
graphic illustrations. This in 2008, in fact, this was work that was done for the World Bank. The authors are all cited in the report. I'm not going to uh, give full accreditation all the way along. This is an analysis of 141 liberalization episodes that compared per capita growth rates before and after liberalization. Countries liberalizing had growth rates 1.5 percent higher post-liberalization. About a year later, there's work done for the Inter-American Development Bank. This is a comparison of growth rates before and after 1990, when there was, as many of you would know, there was a wave of liberalization. And it divided countries into those that liberalized and those that did not. This analysis also looked at the impacts on growth of liberalization of consumer goods and found a modest, very modest, uh, but positive impact. But tariff liberalization of imported capital and intermediate goods raised growth rates of about 1% for the liberalizers as, compo as, as opposed to those that did not liberalize. And this is a story that you all understand very well. Over the past 30 years or so, trade openness and growth has been particularly significant in some merging and less developed countries, in particular, of course, in East Asia and the Pacific. And this graph simply shows the correlation of GDP per capita with trade openness. It's a pretty impressive slope. You turn to trade and employment for a moment and talk about the contribution that trade can make to new and to better jobs. Again, you'll find ample reference in the book to the reality that exporting firms tend to pay higher wages. In the United States, for example, on average 6% higher wages paid by exporting firms relative to non-exporting firms. There are a number of studies pointing to the role of imports in creating higher wage and higher skill jobs, primarily through productivity growth. There are studies that suggest in manufacturing, pay rates in open economies relative to closed could be several multiples higher. There is a study that talks about the most open sectors offering wage rates 25 percent higher than less open. Now, what's important here, this is not just about trade policy. This is also about labor market conditions. And that's an important factor in looking at these benefits. And I'll come back to that a little bit more later on. Openness to trade can also improve overall working conditions, however measured. Fewer injuries, uh, less child labor, reduction in hours worked, and so on. In developed countries, this, uh, this graph uh, is built from the OECD uh, economic database and it, it simply shows the long-term uh, relationship between imports and unemployment. And I think it's clear that they're not correlated in the long term. But I want to be really clear about this point. Of course imports can cause job displacement and the associated adjustment requirements and adjustment costs in the short term. And this is why the complementary policies that I talked about at the moment, and I'm going to talk more about it in, in just another moment or two, are so very important. But it's useful not to lose sight of the fact that in the long term, imports and unemployment are not correlated in developed economies. I think it's well understood that China has had impressive export growth and of course has become the world's largest exporter recently. But perhaps what's not so well known is the import growth in China has been almost as impressive. China is obviously a very large and a fast growing market for a wide range of goods and services. But I want to make an additional point. Preliminary work that we've done at the OECD has estimated that more than 25 percent of China's total export value derives from, from China's imports of intermediate inputs. Now this reflects China's role in global value chains and it reflects the fact that China is importing 
a number of intermediates, it's adding value, and it's exporting the gain. I think it's also useful to not hide some of the rea reality that people, that again Carol referred to, are confronting. The global location of manufacturing has clearly shifted from higher to lower income countries over the past couple of decades. So we have more manufacturing jobs globally, but fewer in high income countries, while at the same time seeing very strong income growth in East Asia, as well in some countries in Eastern Europe, and so on. Now, of course, some of those fewer manufacturing jobs, some of those jobs that do remain in high income and open economies pay better and the working conditions are better. But there's no question, in high income countries, there's a decline in manufacturing employment and an increase in less developed countries. But that's only a part of the story. Services sectors have accounted for significant income and employment growth in all of our economies, in particular in high income countries, but in middle income countries as well. And in the interest of time, I'm going to go rather quickly through the next couple of slides. They're, they're available essentially what they, they, they attempt to show. If you just focus on the bottom right, the, the, the growth of employment uh, in goods, it's negative, and this is in high income countries. Uh, in services, it's uh, quite high. And of course, there's productivity and value added data as well. But the, just to illustrate the, the, the point that the, the, the available data uh, for high income countries supports what I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of people have been commenting, uh, including in the press. Let me move to complementary policies because I don't want to rush through this part of the presentation. Um, trade policy can potentially create opportunities, but their potential, their potential unless the necessary companion policies that enable an inclusive growth are in place. Now this is a seriously at risk of overgeneralizing, but public investment in high quality education and training, strategic investments in infrastructure, IT, transport and so on, are absolutely essential to, turn, to turn the potential of trade opening into, the, into a reality of, of economic activity. Macroeconomic policies and governance systems have to create a positive a climate for a private investment and in particular for key services sectors. Now, services are important sources of growth and a very large part of all, our, all of our economies, developed, middle-income, even less developed countries. But services are also critical inputs into manufacturing. Active labor market and social protection policies are also necessary. They're necessary to match vacancies with job seekers. They're necessary to recognize and to deal with the reality that job displacement uh, and, and, and movement to, 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 to new jobs is not automatic, it's not in, uh, immediate, it's not without cost. So support for training and skills upgrading, for job search and even for job creation, public service jobs, support to private industry for job establishment, even self-employment assistance. There's a range of examples cited in the book. As well, temporary income support, employment insurance, wage insur insurance and the like are needed to provide social safety nets to facilitate the adjustment. This is a little high risk, but I, I want to, essentially what I want to do is try to illustrate that there is no silver bullet, there is no simple answer to what constitutes the right companion policies. They vary significantly across countries. In very general terms, public investment in people 
in their education, in their training, in their health and well-being, public investment in physical infrastructure, bricks and mortar, except it isn't bricks and mortar anymore, it's internet and telecom, transport facilities. They can be particularly important in less developed countries simply because they don't exist or they exist to a much less significant degree than in more developed economies. As well as reducing the costs of doing business and the disincentives to participating in the formal sector. Social protection policies in many less developed countries may also require special attention to ensure that they can be delivered and that they don't just exist on paper, for example. That they're affordable and they don't draw limited resources away from desirable investments in things like education and health and so on and that they don't in fact discourage employment and push people even more so into the informal economy. The book also includes a number of uh, interesting examples of I guess what I would call innovative uses of, of public works and targeted cash transfers as well as new sources of financing. Yes of course general taxation but if your system doesn't exist and if you're a resource rich, mineral rich country for example, there are examples in the book of, of using mineral taxes to fund some of, these, some of these programs. So I think some of these areas warrant further attention. Let me take the last minute or two to say some things as clearly as I can. Uh, the first is that the, the four or five points that I'm going to make, they're not a menu, it's a, it's a policy package. You need to do all of this. You don't get to do one and two, maybe you're not sure about three, four, and now we don't like that. Okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a package, it's a bundle. And the first thing I guess I would suggest in that bundle, in talking to governments, is don't go backwards. Avoid trade protectionist actions that will stifle productivity and growth and in the long term lead to job losses. It's much better to protect workers, to invest in people, than to protect jobs, than to try to protect jobs. Second point, open your markets further. Whether you do it multilaterally at the WTO or regionally, TPP or something else, or you decide to do it all by yourself, unilaterally. Trade can play a powerful role in contributing to raising incomes and creating jobs. But, and this is the same but that was on the first slide, but openness in goods and services is not a sufficient condition for inclusive growth and prosperity. Third point, it is also necessary, as I've said a couple of times, to provide a strong foundation for that growth, investing in supply side capacity, invest in education skills, invest in people, invest in physical infrastructure, and make sure you encourage, you have in place the kind of investment climate, business climate that encourages private spending as well. And the fourth part of the package, it's also necessary to implement active labor market policies and robust social safety nets to equip workers to exploit these new opportunities that are potentially created by more open markets, but also to assist in the adjustment process. And I guess the, the final point I'd, I'd like to make is we, we shouldn't forget that growth itself can be a very important adjustment policy as rapid growth creates a greater flow of job opportunities. Now we've seen recent evidence in the negative with the Great Recession, the trade collapse, and the increase that we've seen in all of our economies in unemployment. Trade offers a potential stimulus for economic growth and I think one of the things that all of us are interested in these days is economic growth at rates higher than we're experiencing today in our forecast for the short and medium term. So let me stop. There's, I, I won't wave the book around, I'll show you a picture. There's, if you have nothing to do on the weekend, there's about 500 pages you could troll through. If you're busy Friday night, then and Saturday night, then good for, good for you. <laughs> Sunday morning, there's a 
55 page version you can look at over a cup of coffee. And if you're not able to get up Sunday morning, there's a three page version you can take a look at on the Metro. <laughs> Thank you for listening and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks very much, Ken. Um, we'll now, if it's fine with you all, just go in order down the table for simplicity's sake, um, and we'll start uh, with Bill Spriggs of the AFL-CIO. You'll each have, take a few minutes and, and make some comments and uh, of your own, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Um, thank you, Carol. Um, I, I think because this was given in a top-line way, I, I won't give... Um, sort of uh, technical comments on some of the individual papers that underline the, the work um, and instead uh, just talk about this general theme because um, I, I, I think that there are many papers that could have been cited which would have highlighted the difficulty with trade uh, more than those that did get included. But the tone as everyone just heard, is that trade can. So um, I think this is a far more mature state for the debate than um, what many of us were used to hearing, which is trade will or trade does. Uh, trade can do these things. Um, the difficulty, however, is in the real political economy of uh, the actual negotiation of trade agreements. Um, trade can, but the real political economy is that trade policies normally don't. Um, either because the menu of policies to um, accommodate inclusive growth aren't actively part of the trade agreement. So what gets passed in individual countries is not the trade package but a set of agreements that create a set of winners separate from the need to handle the more inclusive issues of growth and prosperity. And therein, of course, lies, lies the rub, as you can see from the United States experience with trying to extend uh, the trade adjustment program that American workers have access to, TAA, which is a very difficult political lift. And um, the administration had to end up trying to tie that to trade agreements for those who are more pro-trade um, in order to try and protect them, but that's not always the case. The experience of the TAA program in the United States, however, is quite clear. The number one way that you benefit workers is have them not lose their jobs to trade. <laughs> Once they lose their jobs to trade, even programs that provide them with income assistance and training assistance, the workers do not get back to their pre-job uh, pre uh, wage level. So this is a very difficult sort of uh, task to undertake. And those who have done the studies that aren't cited here that have pointed out what it means to be a worker in the most trade-intensive industries in the U.S. show this negative impact on those workers. So um, how do we get to the conversation of inclusive growth and prosperity? Part, part of the problem are trade agreements themselves. Um, if you look at what has been happening with social protection floors as an example, the ILO, and maybe Nancy will talk about this a little bit um, more, uh, has been very active in trying to promote uh, a set of principles that um, countries can agree to because the actual convention on this was too stringent. Um, and the use of the term social protection floors is meant to allow countries to develop their own take on uh, growing out of their country what would be these institution, uh, what would be these institutions of social protections. However, many of these things could potentially uh, come across as trade barriers given the way that we negotiate trade. India, as an example, has a guaranteed job program where they assure that people get a kind of civil service job where they do some simple road construction or some other kind of simple thing. Now, 
Um, in the United States, we don't have roads like they do in India. Uh, if we were to implement uh, a public works job in today's world, many people think that we should, um, it's not going to look like India's, um, and it would may involve major construction, um, which is subject to trade, <laughs> which means that it's very difficult for a country to say, we want to hold this for an American company to do because we want to hire Americans to build these roads because we're trying to address the unemployment rate in the United States. Um, so, so this tradable goods to include government programs means that an attempt at coming up with social protection floors can be quite complex for a country because they can easily trip over, uh, trip over these issues. Um, wage subsidies, can, can we subsidize the wages of workers um, without making that appear that you subsidize the industry? Um, these are very difficult things, and, and as countries struggle within their context to come up with what would be their social protection floors, how would they uh, generate these uh, from within, the, the reality is that the, the delivery system will depend on the maturity of their formal sector, their government sector, and their view about what is supposed to be public, direct hiring by their government, and what would be uh, subsidized by their government through government procurement as opposed to actual direct government hiring. There are also issues uh, that are raised here which um, were the cause of uh, great headaches for me for three years in looking at regulations in the United States. While it may not be the case that uh, their researchers documented a race to the bottom, I can assure you uh, that um, that to, to advance uh, regulation in an advanced economy is, is very difficult in the face of trade and trade agreements. Uh, the issue of process not being something that is often uh, included within trade agreements, and in many cases process is forbidden. You cannot uh, talk about process, but process is really one of the main ways in which we can protect labor and labor rights in working conditions. Um, process is, in fact, kind of essential to that. So having that removed from the trade framework um, actually works greatly against the advantage of continuing to improve the conditions of workers globally. Uh, it is a challenge. Uh, the United States, uh, under the current administration, has been far more aggressive than the United States has ever been in trying to make sure that there are labor rights. Um, but, but I assure you that that's a huge challenge um, to try and make sure that, uh, that labor rights can be incorporated within trade agreements. Um, and there are many uh, of there are many people who think that they aren't adequately in incorporated, even with the heroic uh, efforts from the administration. There are many people who think that those efforts aren't strong enough and have not produced enough protection for, for labor rights. So the continued battle uh, about the right to organize and the meaning of free association continues to be a very difficult thing to, to ensure, and again, as long as we're going to insist that trade cannot talk about process um, and labor being one of the key process issues, um, that's going to be a big difficulty in having inclusive growth with prosperity. Um, so, so while trade can do these things, um, it will be a huge challenge to the trade infrastructure, both to uh, understand the need to uh, include process, but the need to include a um, great deal of latitude for countries to come up with their own social protection floor schemes. Uh, and all of them will not look the same, and some of them need to be protected from what the trade um, programs currently would prevent. Finally, I would say in the can uh, as opposed to trade does is the issue of uh, trade uh, clearly can play a role in increasing national income. Without a doubt, 
uh, national income in the United States continues to grow despite trade. But the deep issue is distribution. And the question becomes whether income distribution becomes so skewed that it becomes itself an impediment to future growth. One could easily argue from the level of inequality in the United States that that is, in fact, the problem that we are confronting right now. So while, yes, the nation is better off, and yes, GDP per capita has grown, the level of inequality has grown to levels that are, in fact, intolerable. They cannot sustain uh, the U.S. economy. Um, and it clearly, uh, as we have seen, cannot be sustained by household debt. Um, and it won't be going forward in the United States, given the huge debt overhang and the household sector, which has not been addressed at all. So um, it's not important to look at income growth or average income growth, but it is very important to look at income inequality as one of those factors. And I don't think that these studies would have been able to pass the test on income inequality. Um, clearly, in the advanced countries, the pressure on income inequality is great from trade. And that, in and of itself, can be a sustainable factor. Which sectors grow can be a factor. In the United States, the sector that has grown the most during, quote unquote, free trade and is sort of held up as the example of the transition out of manufacturing into service has been financial services. And yet some studies now suggest strongly that there is a level at which financial services becomes a drag. It can only be but so big. It is an intermediary sector. It's no different than transportation. It's supposed to move goods from one place to the other. That's what transportation does. Uh, financial intermediation is supposed to move savings to investment. That's what it's supposed to do. That's it. Uh, with computerization, with more information, with the, with the lowering of cost of information, that should be a sector that's shrinking because of efficiency, just as the agricultural sector in the United States is a tiny sector in terms of, of employment. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge sector in terms of productivity. Finance has gone the other way. <laughs> um, it eats up resources. It eats up income. Um, and no longer is it something that's, that is efficiently moving savings to investment. It is something that thinks it's creating its own thing, which we saw from the derivatives that collapsed the entire world economy. So I think um, it, 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 it is important not just to look at whether incomes are growing, but which sectors grow, what drives the inequality. And I think it's very difficult to ignore the effect of those sectors on sustainability of growth inequality on sustainability, and the political economy that is generated by those forces. The political economy makes it very difficult to have conversations on social protection floors because you're talking about redistribution. You're saying trade gives countries more income, but it doesn't give more income to everyone. So if everyone's going to benefit, then you'd have to redistribute the benefits of that trade growth. And that is a difficult political economic question. Um, so can trade, I think this is a very mature and we're in a much better space so we can have this kind of conversation and we can really talk about how you really could structure trade that would benefit everyone. Can trade benefit everyone? Obviously, yes, it can. Does it or will it? I think it's still a test to, to, to be seen. Um, I, I wish that the studies were a little bit more inclusive because then I think we would have been a little bit more skeptical on the will and does. Uh, we would feel more confident about the can. Thank you, Dr. Spriggs. Um, and speaking just briefly, just having come from the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations, I, I think one of the most important evolutions in trade negotiations over over the past decade, over the past few years, has been, you know, the growing insistence that the five core ILO principles be included um, in enforceable uh, in enforceable labor chapters in trade agreements, and and certainly building on that is is a challenge that that the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative accepts with alacrity, and we're pleased to find uh, um, 
commonality with, with like-minded partners on that. And, and so I think you, you rightly raise the idea that we need to keep advancing that ball. Um, uh, but, but, but I would say, and Kathy Schalk just walked in, uh, <laughs> I, I would not say the last 10 years in the United States. I would say the last three years in the United States. <laughs> I would not give credit to anything before this administration. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a, as a member of this administration, I'll say good point. Um, so next we'll move on to uh, Dr. Lederman and uh, the lead economist uh, of the International Trade Department here at the World Bank and he'll make comments and, and then we'll keep moving so that we can make sure to get to your questions. Well, for, uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, on behalf of the World Bank I'd like to welcome all of our guests who are visiting with us today. Uh, uh, thanks, Ken, for the presentation, Carol, for, for managing this, this event. Um, uh, I would also like to say that I'm a member of the steering committee of the EyeSight Initiative, and I've been working closely with uh, our colleagues at the OECD, ILO, WTO, IADB, uh, ADB, uh, and a bunch of others, I think, that I've probably missed. Uh, it's really amazing, Ken and colleagues, uh, how the global environment for uh, interagency cooperation has changed in the last uh, handful of years. Uh, we uh, individually don't have incentives to, to work across our uh, 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 agencies, uh, but the EyeSight Initiative has shown a model that I think uh, uh, works. Um, having said that, I've also uh, read various versions of, of, the, of the book and some of the papers. I've uh, been at at least one of the original conferences and heard several of the uh, presentations. And it's an incredibly large body of work that has been assembled and, and we've all learned uh, a lot. In spite of the fact that there might, might have been some uh, references that could have been brought in uh, on both sides of, 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 the, of the debate. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted to be here and to be a, an active participant in this uh, international collaborative initiative on trade and employment. Um, I do want to spend a few minutes that I have highlighting um, a very important knowledge gap that we still have in spite of all, all of our efforts. And it has to do with uh, adjustment costs. And um, to put it bluntly, Trade and international integration, trade liberalization, or integration through other means uh, presents opportunities. It can lead to faster growth and uh, an employment uh, creation. However, part of those gains must come and will continue to come through job destruction. The least efficient firms will disappear in face of competitive pressures. Uh, and usually the most productive, largest firms will survive and grow as they expand their penetration of foreign markets. Of course, there's the technology diffusion effect, which could have a productivity enhancing effect within firms, so that firms that participate in international transactions learn how to do things better, and they raise the productivity. Part of those productivity gains themselves might, might be labor saving. All right, so on the side of creative destruction and on the side of within firm productivity gains, there's gonna be worker dislocation, okay? And this worker dislocation, by the way, will occur not necessarily when there's a trade agreement being implemented or a trade reform or a unilateral trade reform being implemented. It could come from uh, restructuring of the global economy, the most recent phenomenon that we've seen in this vein, is the advent of China and to some extent India into the global economy where the products that they've become competitive at have dropped in prices in global markets and have squeezed out competitors in third markets or import competing firms and workers in developing countries and in advanced countries as well. Right? So there's this promise of all of these gains that uh, everybody could, could benefit in some theoretical long run, but the process of adjustment itself can be painful for some workers in some industries, in some countries, more than others. And unfortunately, I think that even to this day, we don't have a firm grasp on how big these adjustment costs are for uh, across different types of countries, right? And needless to say that if we don't know how big these adjustment costs are, we don't know also 
what are the underlying sources of these adjustment costs that might make them higher or lower in two different uh, country contexts. For example, often it's policies that could be well-intentioned when they were implemented that act as de facto taxes on labor mobility by raising either hiring costs or severance costs, right? Uh, and certainly we need workers' protections to uh, protect them from asymmetric collective bargaining uh, 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 processes, broadly speaking, right? But nevertheless, these well-intentioned policies might act as de facto taxes adding costs to labor mobility. Other aspects of public policy that we seldom discuss in the international trade uh, arena, for example, uh, public health systems. If you have countries where your health insurance is tied to your workplace, well, if competitive pressures mean that your firm has closed doors, not only do you lose your earnings, you will lose your health insurance. And therefore, the cost for the worker of being unemployed or looking or transitioning to new potentially uh, higher uh, paying job can be tremendously painful. Whereas in other contexts where there's a single payer system, you don't, workers don't absorb those costs and then therefore they, they are less likely to resist transitioning in and out of their current places of work. Also, countries differ in terms of their size. And to the extent that industries are spatially concentrated the classic case is farmland in the inland and manufacturing near the, sea, uh, the seaports. Well, if farming is going down and manufacturing is rising, there's got to be tremendous rural to urban migration. Mm -hmm. And there might be policies that were justified in some period of time in a particular country's history that tax that process of labor migration. Alternatively, you can have very small countries where really just moving next door, right? So those mobility, literally moving people to an alternative job, those costs might differ across countries depending on a variety of issues. Last but not least, there might be skills mismatches, where the skills that are acquired in an industry sometimes over years, if not decades of experience, and that industry enters into a senescent stage because it becomes uncompetitive because of these global forces, those workers have to find alternative employment. And yes, trade can be the engine through which these alternative employment opportunities are created. However, the productivity of that worker will be lowered this new industry because potentially the skills that were acquired on the job at the previous industry are not transferable. So that worker's productivity, and if markets work perfectly, will have to, uh, it's, the worker's productivity will fall in the new industry relative to the previous one, at least for some period of time until the new on-the-job skills are acquired. And this also can be quite painful. Now, in developing countries, we've experienced a flourishing of different types of safety nets, many of them which would meet the definition of floors, others not so much. In fact, I think that we've now, on the other side of the fence, where we have in some countries so many targeting different populations or demographic groups that were deemed vulnerable at some point in each country's history, that actually it's an open question whether or not developing countries should think of a trade adjustment assistant type of program. On the other side of the debate over this is that dislocation due to trade is different than temporary or transitory dislocations that are common in any economy as it goes through its business cycle and as there's uh, a churning and turnover in the private sector where the best firms survive and, 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 and the least productive firms can, can die even if there's no foreign competition. 
However, with trade, the expectation is that these, pro these adjustments are long-lasting. So to the extent that trade agreements and trade reforms are maintained and sustained, well, you're going to enter into a process of adjustments going to last who knows how many years, but it will be years, if not decades, as, as an essence industry disappear and the emerging uh, industries uh, grow past its in infancy. In, so this, the horizon of the time of adjustment does, to some extent, justify, from the point of view of developing country governments, that we at least begin to engage into a dialogue about whether or not we're missing one more piece of the social protection system. But from the point of view of developing countries, this must mean that something else got to give way. And we have to think of a way of rationalizing this uh, multidimensional, uh, often highly complex system of conditional cash transfers, multiple conditional cash tr transfer system, plus other social protection uh, assistance programs um, that uh, uh, convive. And the, it, it's, it, it might even be uh, present complications for the worker to choose what he's eligible for. Uh, so I, I think the time is ripe for developing countries to begin thinking about whether or not trade itself justifies a different type of social protection program or mechanism that is common in high-income countries but not common. Actually, I can't think of a single developing country that has TAAs. Yeah, I think it's Europe and the United States, basically, where the tradition of the TAA exists. Final point about this is that because of the potential for skill mismatches to be a source of adjustment costs, the TAAs seem to be very nicely designed, right? They kick in after you lose your unemployment insurance, and it's conditioned on the worker actually being displaced due to foreign competition, and it's conditioned on retraining, right? Now, I think I've read some of the same literature that you've read. It's not obvious that these retraining programs are working. Uh, so uh, de facto, these programs are becoming sort of extended unemployment uh, uh, insurance coverage mechanisms for workers displaced due to trade, which allows them to cover them for a longer period of time. And if we're right that these processes of adjustments due to trade are more long lasting than what's common on a normal type of business cycle uh, uh, displacement, then maybe that is an enough, uh, um, it's enough to justify the existence of the program even if, if the retraining doesn't uh, uh, have a direct measurable impact. Now, I must say, Bill, that th that literature is in its infancy when you compare it to the literature in development economics uh, r related to impact evaluations, where you have a random, you set a control group and, uh, uh, and a treatment group, you design the intervention scientifically so that then you can evaluate it. And I think that hasn't happened in the advanced countries for a variety of reasons. Um, so, just to conclude very quickly, I think we need to, do, to know more. We need to know how big are these adjustment costs in practice, because there might be some economies where these are, are negligible. And so the last thing you want to do is introduce more frictions through some sort of program that creates incentives for a worker to remain idle for a longer period of time. Um, so knowing how big the problem is, I think it's, <laughs> it's particularly important. We don't know that yet. And then knowing the causes, the sources of, these, of, of the overall adjustment cost in the economy is also important so that for the long run, we can also tackle the sources of the adjustment cost directly. And finally, if for political er economy reasons or for economic or social efficiency reasons, some of the sources of these adjustment costs cannot be eliminated, then there's room for discussion about how to design socially efficient trade adjustment assistance programs in developing countries that already have a large menu of options in place. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. And we'll move quickly to uh, Nancy uh, Donaldson from the uh, ILO Washington office, and uh, she'll give us her thoughts, and then we'll move on to a quick Q&A session. Thank you, Carol. Is my is mic on? Good afternoon. Um, I, I just want to start by saying I've been privileged in this period, which is um, uh, mostly uh, that we've been our institutions have been pushed together to collaborate and struggle over these issues, coming with different mandates, have been in the in the wake of the Great Recession. And uh, and so these questions have become more intense and somewhat different because of our experiences with the Great Recession. But I also want to start just by saying to Ken, thank you very much. Uh, you know, the things that we've all worked together, uh, reports for the G20, collaborating World Bank, WTO, OECD, ILO, and on other projects have been challenging because we started as institutions that saw ourselves and our mandates as not so connected to one another. And one of the things that really has struck me about this process, and I think I was, I might have been at one of the, the very cr early creation uh, meetings, is that even, even if, um, even if there's a willingness to do it, leadership really matters. And so the OECD really gets the credit on this one for pushing it all the way through, working with the colleagues. My colleague who was in the steering committee, who's not here today, Marian Jansen, um, is an amazing um, economist and has done a lot of contribution. And what I want to say about the ILO's obsession with these issues, which she has helped to drive, and Eric, her, her counterpart, who's actually here, one of the authors of one of the chapters, um, is this question around globalization and how to make it socially sustainable. That's what we, we want to know. And what I find in this discussion, and welcome, is that that question is, we are converging on that question together. And so for all our friends in the business community here who today were saying, this is so thick, there's so much data in it, um, it's hard for us to translate. I was thinking, actually, the countries want it more. They want more data. They want to understand where the problems lie more deeply and, and uh, because we're getting to the level of the person and the sector and the differences with countries and, and I think it's incredibly important. So, um, but I do want to tell you, multi-agency collaborations are challenging and I do feel like we're evolving and uh, in, in, uh, learning to work with all our best sources because of that. So I do want to say, historically, we, I'm going to show you two books um, that came before this one that ILO did with the, with the WTO, and that was the title of our first one, Making Globalization uh, Socially Sustainable. And that's still our main theme. We also have another one, and, and there's some very important contributions by some of the best uh, thinkers on these issues. And this one, Trade and Employment uh, from Myths to Facts, uh, which was sponsored by uh, the European Union. There, so this, this body of knowledge is really growing. And, and um, what we have learned from this, I want to say, coming into the eyesight work, uh, is uh, a couple key, uh, three key challenges. Um, and um, uh, so here they are, and, and Ken dealt with them identify them some in, in his work, so I'll say it briefly. So one is that the structure and the levels of employment emanating uh, from increased openness, we are finding, can be more favorable and can be less favorable. And so our response at ILO, and I think all of us is, so we need to understand it more deeply. Yes, there are favorable things, but they're not all favorable. And so taking that apart is part of what we're all working on doing. Um, the second challenge um, on openness is that while helping to buffer domestic shocks, um, it can increase uh, the vulnerability of labor markets to external shocks. And that's why the Great Recession has been a laboratory of loss and pain and, and change um, that we're trying to understand a lot from uh, because uh, these shocks Really, the institutions like the World Bank, ILO, and, and all of us together have to prepare, and we are preparing, uh, with a way of thinking which is not when is the next shock, but when it comes, how is it, are we going to be able to deal with it differently? What's the shape going to be? If more shocks will come. Why? Because we are uh, a, a globalized uh, world economically, and 
and uh, it hits in different ways, but we can't avoid it. And so how does that factor in the question of making globalization socially sustainable? Um, third, um, what Bill was talking about, and, and there is a real concern and there's a fa fascinating research going on on this question about distribution and a lack of equal distribution and uh, how some workers and firms and sectors lose out um, in the short term and the medium term and how sometimes a great concentration of wealth either in capital or in, um, in income doesn't contribute to growth. It actually uh, may be dragging it back. So what do we do about those things then? And sorry to say I didn't come with all the answers, but um, one thing I do want to say, uh, I wasn't going to go too deeply into social protection. When we say social protection is different from the United States, which is sort of social security, it's any, any government policy and intervention in the life cycle from birth to death, pensions, childcare, that can touch labor mobility, that can touch uh, readiness for jobs, that, that uh, is a way of supporting uh, people's world of work. Um, well, why are we worried about this? Uh, because we're worried because there is sluggish pro progress in the trade negotiations. We mentioned TPP, this is a very interesting and important trade negotiation, but it's really the only one going on right now with the U.S. Um, and, um, and there and, and we seem to have avoided in the Great Recession most protectionism responses, but there's still those kinds of things going on. And we fundamentally have a mistrust from the public, not just in the U.S., not just in some places in the world, about the role of trade in, in, the, world, in the world economy. And so we really need to think about these things because the publics of the world need to uh, be told the truth and be a part of a great growth, a job-intensive recovery, um, and how how that works in what is, to some degree or many degrees, a borderless world. Um, so I think none of us are now falling back on that simplistic thing of just saying, "Hey, trade creates good jobs and growth, and that's the answer." We're not quite saying that anymore. Um, and so instead, we're actually trying to get down to the bottom of these questions. Um, so let me just say that um, we think trade, employment, and social policies, as you suggested, Ken, need to be pursued together in a combination. And investing in public goods and the, and, and the strengthening of markets uh, uh, has to go hand in hand. And if it does, countries really benefit. And it's not something that just business uh, or labor or uh, players in the economy can do, the, go the, the, role, the government has to have a role. Um, and that's where the social protection comes in. Uh, uh, an example of social protection is, social, is uh, unemployment insurance and some very fundamental things. Um, but the skills mismatch, which we've heard others talk about, I won't go into, uh, the, there's a lot of people working on it. It's real, uh, we, we, we have some big challenges in that way. Um, so let me just mention briefly, ILO contributed three chapters to the book. Um, chapter four, openness, wage gaps, and unions in Chile, and we were really looking more at regional things, uh, is I recommend to you. Um, in that um, uh, chapter, um, there were some important contribution talking about how higher levels of unionization and labor participation contributed to more good jobs and better wages. And uh, so we hope that that chapter actually uh, illustrates um, how the role that unions can play in a growing productive economy. Um, the second uh, chapter we did was on regional trade and domestic labor market regulation. Um, and that was chapter 10. Um, that paper shows that after entry into the force of a, of a regional trade agreement, that labor market regulation regarding employment protection and unemployment benefits tends to be weakened in high-income countries. And so this whole question of what happens <laughs> um, is important because if that's a result, that could set us back. That could reduce support for uh, socially sustainable globalization. 
Uh, the third paper, paper was called, uh, it's Chapter 14, Regional Trade and Employment in ECOWAS, which is the, in the West Africa region, and Eric, uh, this is his chapter. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know if I, I didn't know you were going to be here, so I don't know if I can summarize this one quite as well. <laughs> so we would say, why don't you give me two sentences on it, can you? <laughs> <laughs> but you have to speak up. Regional, uh, regional exporting firms. Since we're, since we're uh, streaming on Facebook, if you could step to the microphone, that would be terrific. Ah, thank you. <laughs> this gave me two more seconds to think about it. The, um, the chapter is an attempt to look at differences in job creation between regional and global exporting firms. And a bit contrary to what I had expected, I find that they're actually remarkably similar, at least in the ECOWAS region, where regional exporters actually create pretty good jobs as well. But this also indicates that there are still substantial obstacles to them to further expand. Good enough? Pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. So we, we say, ILO, that the, the contributions, these contributions to the book confirm that um, the trade is likely to have potential to contribute to employment growth, um, but that open markets are unlikely to create enough good quality jobs. And I do think that I just want to mention that this whole subject of quality jobs, which we're very excited and anticipating uh, uh, the next WDR report coming from the World Bank, um, which is going to focus on this question for a worldwide strategy, is going to be very important. Um, we are going to continue to work and research these areas so that we can help our member countries and our member constituents um, to pull together uh, solutions that are complementary. We want to maximize benefits of trade policies in the quality and quantity of jobs uh, uh, through good uh, matching policies. Um, so we consider this work together, the process of this work together, as a step in the direction of, of better understanding mechanisms uh, through which globalization affects workers, people, and their families, and the measures that governments can take uh, to have a strong, I mean, this is what we want, this is what we're going for, a strong social dimension so that trade can successfully improve growth, so that labor is enhanced and grows with it. And we do have examples uh, around the world and we're looking for more. And we are also studying services. Uh, we've just completed a pretty ex interesting and really deep study about Indonesia, which I, I probably my colleagues know. Uh, and you know, it's again mixed results. Uh, major export of uh, uh, work and low income work that isn't progressing in other ways. And yet, that's the biggest part of the growth industry in uh, Indonesia is the service sector. So much to learn. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and because I have not ruled with an iron fist, because our speakers were so interesting, uh, we have a little bit of a limited time for questions. But if anyone has questions, if you'll just step to the microphone. We'll see if anyone is uh, bringing questions or just part of the general exodus at this point. Excellent. If you'll just step to the microphone, please, and we'll take your questions. I'm asking this, sorry. It is on, is it? Well, yeah. we can all gather around much more closely now. <laughs> so if I can ask this question to provoke a conversation, bit, or I should say a more direct confrontation between Ken and Bill and his other discussants, is um, Ken had a very positive description of the gains from trade and subsequently he tempered it with a set of other complementary policies that need to be in place. So my question about the book, which I haven't had the pleasure to read, is how, what does it say about situations in which these other complementary actions, whether it's the state of infrastructure or health, or the state of complementary labor, labor reform or trade adjustment policies, when they're not in place, there are imperfections, mm -hmm. does that situation mean that there are smaller gains from trade or not gains at all? So in which case, because it does make a difference. It 
does determine how you sequence these complementary reforms and trade reform. So, so that's the first question, because I think that might be a way of also reconciling some of the things Bill and Daniel have been saying vis-a-vis -vis what you said, Ken. The second question, again, this might be a gap in the literature, that we haven't enough what econometricians say, you know, understanding of the interaction effects of liberalization with these complementary factors. The other question is the recommendations themselves about investment in infrastructure, health, ad adjustment programs, and they need resources. And for resources, you need to be able to tax. So the first question is there is this supposed trilemma, the inability of governments to be able to raise resources precisely because factors are mobile. You know, investors and clever people leave if you tax them enough. So do we have anything in the book about whether international mobility of skills and capital constrain the ability of governments to raise the resources to do all these complementary reforms? And also sort of this domestic political question in the United States, are those taxes, is there any evidence that those taxes inhibit job creators? even as you're seeking to mobilize resources to do the complementary reforms. What do we know about these things? Thank you for your question, and I think we'll, we'll probably stick to, to your, your question about what, what the eyesight research contains. Um, particularly, uh, we'll, we'll go to Ken first for that, and we'll try to keep our responses short so we can be sure to get to others. Uh, Adisha, you, you, you know very well that we need three or four days to uh, address some of those questions. Uh, very briefly, um, uh, the, the, the book tries to distinguish between aggregate gains and the distribution of the gains, and it tries to move from econometrics to uh, empirical evidence. It also tries to link outcomes with policies that work and policies that did not work. So when it, it's not trying to answer the universe, it's trying to look for the lessons. And the, I think a, a key point that, that Daniel made, and you've given me an excuse to, to emphasize it, is that we do not know enough uh, about um, adjustment costs. Yes, but that's less interesting to me. We know they're big. Uh, what are the effective adjustment policies that work? And how can they be financed in a way that's sustainable and doesn't distract and distort you know, resource allocation elsewhere in the economy. So I, I, just to say, we, the book doesn't have all the answers, uh, but th this is a key uh, aspect that I think we all need to follow up on. Do we have any other comments on that question? Uh, next question, if you'll move to the microphone. And feel free to cue so that we can move quickly. Yeah. Uh, I guess uh, very much related to the er earlier comment and, and one other, other comment. I mean, you showed the gains from trade post-liberalization episodes. So does it mean that those complementary policies were, in fact, in place to gain, get those uh, uh, gains? I mean, why did we get those gains? So it's not just that trade will, can, it did. So what was, the, what was different then than now? The second question is all, it's not really a question as much as a comment, but I do wonder why the issue of adjustment costs is always tied to trade. I mean, we are talking about adjustment from any innovation. Mm -hmm. You know, when we introduced a computer, we got rid of typing pools. When we introduced a car, we got rid of butt horses and buggies. There is adjustment, but why is it related to trade? Trade is just a relative price change. Ken, and then I think you uh, have mm -hmm. something to say about, <laughs> about the second question. Um, I agree with you. It's not about trade. Um, it's more about uh, technological change, and trade in some cases helps to helps to diffuse that around the world. So I, I take your point uh, entirely. Uh, if I can quickly morph into um, trade uh, is not responsible for all change, neither is trade responsible for inequality. There's incredible amounts of evidence, not from the OECD, yes, from, from, from the IMF, from, I think from the bank as well. Uh, there are very high levels of inequality. It's growing. It's not a good thing. Uh, trade has little to do with that. Neither is trade the solution to it. And we can talk later about what those solutions are. Dr. Springs. The difference is that trade is a government policy, and it's a change in government policy and it creates winners and losers. It's not the same thing. You can't equate it to the movement of the market or of technology on its own. 
It is true that that confounds our ability to discern whether it's the market and globalization in the broad sense, the diffusion of technology, technological information, or whether it was trade that caused it. And, and again, this gets to, the, to a debate about the balance of which studies are included and which ones aren't, and how one does try to econometrically disentangle what are forces that are technological advancement and, and, and change, and what are forces that are tied to a manipulation of policy changes that favor some over others. And so I think that's the short answer to the longer discussion that one would have to have about that. And, and so uh, we, we, we could continue about the role of trade and, and trade policies and the political economy of trade and inequality. Um, just a quick comment. Um, uh, yes, there are examples, um, and uh, and of course some of them are quite famous. For example, what happened in the recession to Germany and its uh, complementary structures uh, versus some other places uh, in terms of how it impacted workers' jobs and sectors. Um, but I just want to mention on social protection, which is really an interesting part of the dynamic of the social floor initiative and the huge uh, social protection strategy that's being led by, by the bank, is uh, a coming to understand that if you have uh, even very austere, uh, not robustly funded uh, uh, government policies in place that would be in social protection strategies, that they um, can, and, and I think we'll gather more evidence that they do, help countries, whole countries and regions prepare for economic shocks and stop the bleeding more quickly and uh, allow adjustments to be made. If you don't have social protection strategies uh, and actual laws in place and you're hit by the, the uh, another recession, let's say, uh, we're pretty sure that it takes, it just, it's hard to get them in place. And so we are now, uh, ILO um, and the IMF, for example, studying uh, some projects in some different countries to look at uh, interventions and, and understand. Um, and this jobs knowledge platform uh, that the bank has, uh, we've la launched a database of that we collected in 77 countries, Dan, uh, of the intervention policies around the recession so that we can start to analyze what's working and what didn't work. Um, and so you'll see some of these as complementary um, to uh, uh, economic strategies or trade strategies. And so I think uh, the, the studies are coming if they're not here already. Excellent. Uh, right over here. Thank you. Uh, on the issue of inequality, I was, would appreciate if Mr. Ash and the other participants could uh, address the recent uh, suggestion in the UNCTAD report for 2012, the trade and development report that basically recommends an activist incomes policy that ties average wage growth to average productivity growth, whether that's viable uh, of a suggestion beyond just um, displacement insurance. Well, you're you're not getting a comment from me on Unctad's report. I suggest you 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 have a word with with uh, with with Unctad about that. Anyone else touching that one? No. Okay. And then <laughs> it raises a valid point because again, I think part of the issue uh, that that makes these conversations often fall apart again is the political economy of trade. So. It, you know, some people want to have the technical conversation about uh, whether uh, importing iPhones into the United States uh, is the cause of something, and then they want to ignore the political economy that goes along with those decisions. Um, I think in their totality, the decisions that have been made around the global positioning of where things get produced has had a significant impact in delinking productivity and wages. And clearly in the United States, it has been catastrophic that we have had this decoupling between the growth and wages and the growth and productivity. Um, so uh, I think UCTAD is on the right track. 
Thank you. And if our, our last question over here will hold for a minute, I would like to take a question from our Twitter audience. Um, one of the comments that, that Nancy made was that um, social protection can, can mean different things in different places, um, that it, it covers a range of complementary policies in truth. Um, and I know one of the things that, that we work on here in the United States are, are prioritizing in the Obama administration is making certain that we're looking at education, that we're looking at policies that will prepare uh, people for the, the jobs that will come with shifts in, in, um, in, in various sectors. And so the question that we have from Twitter is, what about tweaks to public education systems so we have youth going into appropriate pathways? Is it possible to do something like that? Is it, is it possible to look and, and sort of, as, as Wayne Gretzky said in hockey, try to try to get your workforce to go where the puck's going to be? as opposed to where the puck is or or what do we think about about our ability to uh to tailor programs to to uh to fit the trade paradigms of the future not just the trade paradigms of, of today or even the past we think we're very interested in public private partnerships um i think the private sector has to be a part of it um and I know that uh, there are examples of this, um, some well-established examples of apprenticeship programs in some parts of the world, and we're, we are sort of hoping and promoting that people will go back and look at that. Uh, we have some pretty good ones in the United States, actually. Um, but I, that's just one component of that. Uh, um, I also think uh, the the some of the higher education institutions that I've uh, spoken with and the OTA are very actively uh, looking at how to get the skills closer to where the job openings are. I, could, could I just um, agree with Nancy uh, and add a comment from a, uh, an earlier discussion on the same topic this morning where uh, even in general terms, um, college, educated, uh, college ed educated young people in the United States, uh, unemployment rate about 4% uh, as opposed to whatever the average is today. So even generally, okay, education is a good thing. Uh, and the Microsoft representative talked about a major gap uh, between demand and supply uh, with respect to computer science graduates over the coming period. Anyone else have comments on that before we'll, we'll take our last question from over here? Thank you. Uh, a comment on uh, some of what Dr. Spriggs was, was saying, I think, was that trade tends to benefit some of the high-income workers, and trade liberalization is focused on benefiting high-income. And I think uh, in reviewing this study that there is actually some evidence that in the long term, uh, low-skilled or low-wage workers also benefit from trade openness. And I was wondering if um, this OECD could possibly comment on those findings. Thank you. Um, I can agree with you. Um, if you're uh, asking me to pull out the exact study, I'm not able to do that quickly. Uh, but this gives me a great opportunity. Uh, um, uh, Nancy uh, acknowledged the significant contribution of Marion Jensen. I would like to acknowledge the equal significant uh, contribution on the OECD side of Doug Lippold, who's summers in Asia right now. Mm -hmm and I can't find him, uh, but I could, found, I could find Monica, uh, who, who you, you need to wave Monica. Um, she contributed substantially to the work as well, and she will answer that question both for Bill and you uh, when we're finished here. You know the answer, though. Well, m miraculously, we seem to be finishing on time. I'll, I'll try to, to, to give to give one uh, a comment that I, I think will hopefully sum up what, what our, our distinguished panelists have said. Um, there is good news here um, in the findings of this collaborative report that trade can contribute to job growth. And there is further good news in that it offers some signposts for how we can make sure that trade will uh, contribute to job growth. Um, that is super important because the one thing we know is that trade will happen. And so uh, I, I think that that is, that is why it's so important that all of these organizations have come together, have been able to collaborate. That's why it's important that we have people who are identifying perhaps gaps in the scholarship, perhaps issues that we have not sufficiently addressed um, in looking at this uh, body of work so that we can um, 
take a look at, you know, our task seems, seems pretty clear now. Um, we need to take a look at, at this body of research. We need to fill in the gaps. We need to look at some places where we might not still be telling the whole story and then seek to take this from the page uh, uh, to policy um, in ways that, that help trade to fulfill its potential to have a uh, positive impact not only on the economies of countries but on the lives of individuals, which really um, is, is the worthwhile goal here. And so I think that um, all of our panelists are doing a great deal to contribute to that goal in, in various ways with varying opinions. Um, we thank them for being here today. We thank the World Bank uh, for hosting and we thank all of you for coming and have a lovely afternoon.